I started just a little late because we're uh, kind of allowing for changing times and days and weather and all those kinds of things. Um, so welcome to our new home in our new room. No tables. I thought we'd have tables, but we do have, I think we'll probably have more people next month. Um, I think the weather was probably at least scared off a few folks. Well, people don't want to live to 100. Well, <laughs> we're going to get to that, Richard. <laughs> so <clears throat> my name is Karina Stipp. And I am a senior specialist realtor, and um, I uh, normally have a panelist at each of these events. And this month we had two planned. One was a 98-year-old lady um, whose family convinced her that there was too much illness going around. They didn't want her out this morning, so she canceled kind of last minute. And then our uh, other panelist was um, Carla Payne, and she had someone sick on her staff, so she had to fill in. So the good news is I've watched and read a, quite a bit of this, and it's not legal advice, so I can, I can speak to this <laughs> freely. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk today about um, living to 100. And um, to Richard's point, I actually invited my neighbor, Bob, who's in his 70s, he's retired, to this event. And his immediate reaction was, I don't want to live to be 100. <laughs> so, but you hear that from some, is, does anyone here want to live to be 100? There's, yeah, so there's, a, there's a, like parentheses behind that, right? If I am of sound mind and body and my money doesn't run out. Right? Like, I, I get it. Like, there's these asterisks, yeah? So, um, so here's the thing. Some of it you have control over and, you know, you only have so much control, right? So to me, it's about living well as long as you can. That's, to me, really what this is about. So there's some really interesting statistics to take a look at. And um, here, the people are living longer now, which I'm sure a lot of you know, but it's, it's kind of staggering when you look at the statistics. So in 2021, there were 89,000 and change centenarians in the U.S., which is almost double the number in 2010. So just 11 years on, we've almost doubled the number of people over 100 in the U.S., there are currently 593,000 centenarians worldwide, but look at this number, with 3.8 million projected by 2050. What are we going to do with all that, right? The two countries with the most super centenarians, which means they're over 110 years old, are the U.S. and Japan, and Japan has a higher number per capita. And the 65 plus age group is the fastest growing in the U.S. It increased 43% from 2010 to 2022. And that number actually 65 plus in the next 20 years will almost double again. So we're at um, 55 million right now in the U.S. And we'll have 90 million um, by 2040 something. Okay. Kind of staggering, isn't it? So factors to living to be 100. Genetics account for about 25%. I think that's almost the first thing you go to whenever somebody says their age and it's like beyond like 90 something. Wow, you must have good genes, right? And I do think that that's, that's obviously a piece of it for sure. But the other 75%, which is the lion's share, environment, diet, exercise, and community and support. So there's the occasional person you hear of who's lived to be 90-something or 100, and they smoked every day, and they always had a, you know, big snifter or brandy after dinner or two or three. So there's the occasional outlier. But as a rule of thumb, that's not really the case, right? So that's diet, exercise, environment. Oops, I always go the wrong way. So let's take a look at environment. So ideally, um, plan ahead for a time when you might need, and this is wherever you're living, railings. And railings can apply to stairs. I know my mom had a second rail put up the other side because it was just narrow enough that she could reach either one or both. So she had that installed. She had some railings. The first railing she had installed at the last house she lived in before she passed was out front. It was about four or five steps. And she said, you know, I think I'm going to have a rail put in my friends when they come over. That's how that went. 
And I thought, oh, good. And, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking that's good for you, too. And she didn't go out the front that much, but I knew she went out and got the paper every morning. So I was glad to know she had rail put in. But railings can also be a grab bar or something that, in a bathroom or some kind of situation where you've got something to just kind of give you a little support or a little insurance, right? Um, avoid rugs or flooring surfaces that could cause tripping. I see this a lot. Yeah, Richard? We have a, a guy who will put in railings. If you want to see me later, I'll give you his name. Okay. He, he put one in our house. It's beautiful. An interior. Mm. It was exterior. Oh, from right. the garage to, into the house. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. That's good. Because it's helpful to have the guy yeah. or the gal. Okay. Um, rugs and flooring surfaces. When I'm in homes and I'm speaking with seniors who are considering a move, I see this a lot where there's either throw rugs, and God forbid those throw rugs don't have a... Um, one of the grippy things underneath, which I don't, I, those only help so much, or a rug on a rug. So there's a floor to floor carpeting, and then there's a throw rug over that. And those easily, anybody ever seen those curl up? Yeah. And so, you know, it doesn't take much to move your foot wrong or step wrong, and then that's under your foot, and all of a sudden you're tumbling because, oh. So any of those kinds of things that you can remove from the home you live in now to plan even if you're planning ahead that's smart or think about if you're going to stay in the home you're in for the next however many years will that flooring still be suitable for you and start thinking about what can I replace because that's one of the most common is older homes a lot of them had carpet and it may it's harder to move for instance a, a, a walker right across carpet than it is like a smooth surface like this because it's resisting it's pushing back against you it's already hard enough you're already struggling to walk or you wouldn't be using the walker um, ensure adequate lighting is throughout the home and there's a percentage and i don't remember it but when you hit 50 you need almost double the light to see the same that you did before that so then move that another decade another decade another decade and what does that look like, right? So I try to be conscious when I print things that the print is big and dark because <laughs> I like it big and dark, right? So make sure that your, your whole home has adequate lighting so that you can see what you're grabbing, you can see what you're doing, you can see where you're walking, all of those kinds of things. And you know that may include, do you live in a home where you can get to the lighting? Some people have vaulted ceilings and they have light bulbs that go out because it's two stories and who's going to change that? And, you know, so these are all considerations for, you know, when, if or when you decide to change from the home you're currently living in to one that suits you better. Um, bath areas, rails. So rails, non-slip sur surfaces, having no steps and shower seats. This is all really key because it's wet so it it's makes it like times 10, right? It's so much worse when you're getting in and out of that bathroom. So if you can have a zero entry shower or one with just a teeny lip, that's something to look towards as well. Um, often I get asked the question about these step-in bathtubs. Those, if I'm comping a house or if an appraiser is, those do not add value to your house. Does not matter what the salesperson tells you. Does not add value. Because the 25-year-old who's buying their first house or the 35-year-old, they don't want that. And the problem with it is, so neighbor Bob put one in for his almost 100-year-old dad. And he's a retired engineer, so he quickly realized it emptied the hot water heater, first of all. So he put in a tankless water heater. So that would bypass that problem. But here's the real problem. You get in there, and once you've taken your bath, you have to wait for the whole thing to drain because the door is sealed, right? So otherwise it's gonna let the water all flow all over the floor. So you're sitting in there shivering while you're waiting for that to drain. In dirty water. In dirty water. <laughs> yeah, so, so just, you know, it's those kinds of things that seem like a solution, think that entirely through before and ask questions of people who aren't going to financially benefit by answering you meaning the salespeople who are selling you those things. So, yeah, Richard. Another idea, um, you can put down washcloths in your shower, and it gives you more traction with your feet. Okay. But it's a, 
Some people say it's not good, but it works for us. Okay. And they don't move around on you? Well, they, you can move them around with your foot. Yeah. But they, but they stay they in place. Slip. Okay. As long as they're not soapy. Right. I mean, I can see where it would be some help. I would worry that it would be, you know, something that I, I'm a klutz. I'd get it caught on my foot or something. And <laughs> I do think every bathroom should have, or every house should have a walk-in shower. So if you have two tubs, spend the money and put a shower in. Absolutely. And it absolutely does not hurt resale. No. Um, and so, you know, back in the day, I can remember, so my dad and my grandfather were both um, realtors. And there was a back in the day, you remember when there were three quarter baths? And that was a sink, a toilet, and a shower, but it didn't have a tub. There's, and no one uses that terminology now. You either have a full bath, which is either some way to bathe, out of, other than the sink, right? Some way to bathe, toilet, and sink. That's a full bath, period. Whether it's a shower or a shower tub combo or just tub, whatever. But you're right. I, I do think it hurts resale if you have a home that has no tub at all for some buyers who have young families that ha want to bathe their child. But if you're in a, for instance, a 55 plus, there's no need for a tub at all. There's really not. At one point, wasn't there a law that you had to have it? But I think that in a lot, and that was state law, and a lot of states have dropped that. May have been, I, that I don't, rem I don't know, um, or, and each state may, will differ. Um, each state differs as far as when you're selling a home. In the state of North Carolina, your personal property includes your refrigerator, your washer, and your dryer. But the stove is required in order for a certificate of occupancy. But I don't know anybody who cooks that doesn't get stuff out of the fridge. So it, to me, it makes no sense. You know, some of that's kind of antiquated. Um, so whenever you're selling your home, you can sell it with or without the fridge, washer, or dryer um, if you're going, you know, if you think you may want to leave those behind. Um, but the stove is required, and anything that's built in that's wired, hardwired, like microwave and dishwasher, obviously. Can we go back one step to the flooring? Yeah. Um, non slip flooring. Does anybody have any recommendations for flooring for the, um, the, the bath area itself? Not particularly the bathtub or the shower, but the bath. Because I haven't seen anything, any material that other than wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, which you don't want to have in a bathroom, that would be safe to step out and walk on if your feet are wet. Most of them have tile. They're all tile. Tile or some kind of, now there's, you know, a luxury vinyl plank, which is LVP. Um, you're, I would say that you would want some kind of then non-slip rug or, or mat that you can get out on. Um, so that you have that extra layer, something that's going to work well for that space. You could ask at a flooring uh, store and they're going to walk you through what are going to be the safest flooring okay. surfaces. Of course, tile, like a sandstone. Yeah, they do make that. Nice. Right. There's certainly tile that you can get and even, even vinyl like this. I mean, that's, you can get things like this that are um, less expensive than a tile if you want to do, you know, depending on what your surface is and your budget and so forth. But you can ask at the flooring store and they can help walk you through that. Generally, as a rule of thumb, the, the shinier it is, the slicker it is, for sure. What about cork? I don't know if that's suitable for a bathroom. Yeah, I think cork would, the problem with cork would be mold. Yeah, especially in a bathroom, because it'll, it'll absorb that moisture, for sure. Um, I don't know about bamboo might work, so you could ask about bamboo, because I don't think it rots, so. Um, and I've been in, on bamboo floors before, but I mean, just ask the question tile with an unglazed surface or something that's, I mean, you could even look, sometimes people put commercial products in their homes. So ask about the commercial line and see what that is. Cause you know, if it's commercial, they don't, they don't want any liability. So, you know, if you can find a commercial flooring that looks okay in your home and you're happy with it and you feel like it's safer than something that's not commercial, you know, nobody says you can't use that. So it's something you can go ask for that section of the store, or if, if that store doesn't carry it, ask where they do. Yeah, because that's commercial is always going to be them looking out for themselves in their pocket. It, it, yeah. Um, medical alert system. I went to meet with a lady in Apex a couple years ago. Loved her. Really sweet lady. She's on our mailing list for the newsletters. And she had a husband with dementia who was clearly 
at the end of his time. And she had a walker she sporadically used. She barely made it to the table where we sat down and talked. And then she proceeds to tell me the story about how she's outside. There's a whole new subdivision being built up against her three or four acres. And there's workers who are out and she falls and she's yelling and they're ignoring her. These guys are ignoring her. So she had to scoot on her butt and she gets up on one step and then on another step and then she manages to use the post on the back porch to pull herself up and get back in the house. And she's, she's proud of herself because she's managed to do it in spite of these guys who've been jerks, right? And I look over at the wall and I said, um, but your, is that activated, the medical alert necklace? And she said, well, yes. And I said, so <laughs> why aren't you wearing it? <laughs> Because that would have worked. <laughs> and and she, so that was my first experience with someone. But it, it happens a lot. People have those. They pay for the, for the subscription, right? And then they don't wear them. So for heaven's sake, wear them. Or my uncle got to the point. He had fallen. He broke his hip. He broke his hip and ended up having part of his leg amputated later. It was a long process. And he had left his phone in the house. He did not have medical alert, but he... From that point on, he had a little pouch that he wore around his neck that had his phone down in it. So he never went anywhere from that point in time on without his phone right there. So even if you don't subscribe, most everyone, anybody, everybody have a cell phone? Yeah. Have your cell phone where you can get to it if you've been incapacitated in some way so you can at least call 911. Yeah, I, there was another lady I just met with actually a couple months ago now that I think about Jackie, and she, same thing. She had her phone, but she had taken off her medical alert when she got dressed and went out. And she felt her whole face was bruised when I went to meet with her. Yeah, so she were waiting on some paperwork to get done so she can get into an assisted living. Um, but she was, it was in the heat of the summer. And she'd landed on the pocket that had her phone in it. So she did finally manage to roll just enough to be able to sneak that, that phone out of her pocket. So it, it's something to think about. Um, and you think if the, the idea is think about it before the bad thing happens rather than after. And you go, oh, really should have done X, Y, Z. So um, diet. So this is a big deal, especially in the United States, because obesity is pretty rampant. Um, and blue zone. So we've talked a little bit about blue zone before. So I, um, I honestly, I ordered these last night. <laughs> I've watched this twice. Um, there's a documentary about blue zones on Netflix. And, um, this gentleman is a journalist. He's, uh, kind of traveled all over the world and he wrote about blue zones probably 20 years ago for the first time, might've been even further back. Um, there are five blue zones in the world. And this kind of came to be from a gentleman who was studying concentrations of people who lived to be 100 or more and where they lived and what, and they, they wanted to learn, like, what did they do different that the people that were the next hamlet over didn't do, right? So the five blue zones in the world are Loma Linda, California, uh, Sardinia, Italy. There's a tiny little island in Greece that's just off the, the coast of Turkey, um, Costa Rica, have to think about where's the other one, and Okinawa, Japan, okay? And so he travels, and in this documentary, I think it's four different sections of the documentary, um, he, he talks to people who live in these zones. Um, the only one where men were as equally, living equally as old or to centenarian status in the five blue zones um, was in Sardinia, and the reason why, it's this 2,000 foot above sea level, very hilly, rocky place, and most of the men there are shepherds. And so they have low stress because it's just whether the goat gets in or out or not, you know, <laughs> and milked that day. So it's not, you know, high level decision making, right? And and they walk a lot, and they walk everywhere they go uphill, right? Most of their homes have at least 30 to 40 steps, and they do that every day. So, so that he studied, when he got to this um, 
studying each area. Um, diet was kind of what was suspected, I think, to be a big part of it at first. And then they kind of started discovering these other things and peeling the onion and seeing what, what was the formula, so to speak. And so um, actually what's very interesting in is in all of these blue zones, most of the people would drink one to two glasses of wine a day, and the, every day. And actually, they live longer than the people who don't drink at all. Now, if you get to a point of excess, that's why somebody says, I'm in. <laughs> I think it made like three years difference. The people who drank one glass of wine a day versus those who didn't um, live like three years longer on average. I think red wine is what, yeah. Um, and actually, so two of the other books that I went ahead and got when I, while I was on a roll yesterday, um, there is a Blue Zones kitchen. And I'm not here to sell anything Blue Zones. But there's one on kitchen. And then there's also a challenge to live a longer, better life. Those are all on Amazon. I got them. Literally, I ordered these at 3 o'clock yesterday, and they were on my front porch this morning. So isn't that amazing? I love how that works. <laughs> um, so... The bit, one of the big things in Okinawa is this bullet point, which is, and there's a saying they have in Japanese that I won't remember, but it has to do with before they sit down to eat, they have this little mantra, it's like a couple of words, and they eat until they're 80% full. And they never gain weight for this reason. So they never eat to overflowing where you just keep on, you know, like the buffet kind of thing, right? Um they eat the smallest meal of the day, the, late, um, the latest in the day, so late afternoon, early evening, so the biggest meal is breakfast, um, and eat mostly plants, meat, rarely, and in small portions. And where you see a lot of that, and I think probably one of the big reasons Loma Linda made the list, Loma Linda in California, I mean, it's right out in L.A. in the middle of everything, but it is an enclave of Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and so Seventh-day Adventists... And not all, because I have a dear friend who's a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, and her husband was pastor with the church for 40 years. She was raised as a vegetarian. She raised her children as vegetarians. And uh, so it's just kind of one of their things that they do. And she had lived in Loma Linda for a while, and I remember her talking about how lovely it was that they had a crop of apples that came in, and the whole community got together and made applesauce together. They canned applesauce. So it's something that they literally, it's in the pores of their being, um, she, she's been very interesting to get to know over the years. Now we've been friends for 20 some years, but her son is actually a doctor in Africa. And he was the only doctor who served an area of like 500,000 people for a period of time. He's written some books and, um, I've always kind of wondered how he's done being a vegetarian because sometimes people would come in and trade goats for the services. So I don't know whether... <laughs> He gave that out or he finally kind of ate some meat or, you know, because things were pretty spare, spare there as far as supplies. Um, the foods that are common among centenarians, legumes is probably, beans are probably the number one thing. Um, Costa Rica, um, even Japan. Um, Japan, they had a lot of a purple sweet potato. Now, I'm trying to think of the name of it because I Googled it to see if I could get any. I can't think of something Benna, I think it is, but you, you can look it up. Um, eggs, goat and sheep milk and cheese. Um, there was also a statistic about nuts. Uh, this is almonds in particular, but people who eat nut, a handful of nuts on a regular basis will live, and it's a few years longer than other people. So nuts and wine, everybody run out to the store when we get finished. <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad assignment, right? <laughs> Um, a variety of fruits and vegetables, which makes sense. And, of course, Mediterranean diet came into play with both Greece and Italy. Um, so that didn't make, uh, you know, it totally made sense. Um, one of the things that I saw in the Italian one when he featured that, uh, the ladies made bread. And he said, you know, we're kind of programmed that carbs are bad in the U.S. And so he asked the ladies about the bread they were making. And it was specifically, it was a white bread, but it was sourdough. And the sourdough has a bacteria that's really good for your gut and does a lot of good things for your health. Um, whole grains like brown rice and oatmeal. At the very, in the very last segment of this Blue Zones piece, he, he goes to see Singapore. Has anybody ever been there? Yeah. 
And did you stay for any period of time or? No, we went through there for about two days. Okay. And so you didn't see many cars. No. So the cars, right. So they've designed the whole city around the aspect of people walking and exercising because it keeps their health care costs way down. So to buy a car that, that's a $100,000 car here in the U.S., it's about 250 there. And to get a driver's license, it's about $100,000. You think that's a deterrent for driving? Everybody takes the train. And they've built all of their communities within a 10, 15-minute walk of the trains at the most. So everything is designed around keeping people healthy. And one of the things they've done is brown rice is better than white rice for you. So they've subsidized it. So it's actually cheaper to buy. And so they're incentivizing their whole community, their whole world, right? Their whole city is, is incentivized to live healthier, which costs all of us less, right? Very interesting. Um, small amounts of fish or other lean meats, herbs and spices like turmeric, fennel, and garlic, and green tea, soy milk, and red, red wine. There you go. Red wine. There's another plug for it. <laughs> Is it going to go? Uh-oh. Let's see. So, well, you know, there's the milk producers, actual cow milk producers, there's a whole... Um, uh, lawsuit about calling it milk because it's really not it's mostly probably 90 percent water right oh. yeah i mean i you know and so what the nutritional value i would i would talk to a nutritionist about that because i that i can't can't speak to very well but i do know that there was a big lawsuit about it and that it's you know it's certainly not milk it's just created from a derivative yeah. of yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing for you. It's um, One of the things, my friend Gladys, who was a Seventh-day Adventist, we had a whole conversation one time about milk. And this is, I was, my, my mom, my dad's, my dad's dad was a dairy farmer. So um, I, we had this discussion about milk and butter and so forth. And I just, I can still remember after we retired, we went to a little gas station that had a, just a few groceries right on the corner and I'm standing hand in hand with him in front of the dairy section. And he said, Karina, always buy Highland. Now, Highland was a Missourian brand, a carrier of milk, right? They were the ones who bought his milk all those years. So what he was teaching me was, don't buy the hand that feeds you, right? This, they supported us. We support them. That was the lesson. I didn't know that until later. Um, and so when I was talking to Gladys about milk and I, you know, she said, oh, you drink milk. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of quit the habit, but at that time I drank milk every day. And she said, do you know, we're the only species that continues to consume milk after weaned, yep. which I found a very interesting comment that we continue to consume milk. And yet there's no, you know, there's cats now, you know, if you pour it in a bowl, but they're not going to go out in the wild and, you know. Right? That's not going to happen. And it's actually, they say now it's bad for cats, which is kind of the old thing back. You do cream or, or milk or something. So anyway, kind of an interesting thought. Um, so exercise. And there are pillars of fitness, according to a, a, a doctor who's a fitness expert. Strength, stability, and steady cardio. So one of the things that you see in these blue zones, the Japanese people, it was amazing they don't have really a lot of furniture in their homes. They have mats. So they would sit on the floor cross-legged at 100 years old, and they would get up and down 30 times a day. Well, that's 30 squats, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so then you look at, there was one of the little gentlemen, he, he had his legs crossed like, you know, like one on, t I mean, it was a hard leg cross, and he was showing off about how the different things he could do, and he was right at 100 years old. Um, in Costa Rica, there was a lady who was 100 years old, and she was literally using a machete, and she was splitting wood. So one of the commonalities between all of the different villages that were studied in this Blue Zone study was most of them garden. So they started talking about how their, most of the climates were fairly mild, if not warm, and they thought that might have something to do with it. But when they really looked deeper, it had to do with the fact that the climate allowed a longer growing season. 
And most of these folks grew their own food and would go out and they would be working in their garden on a daily basis, weeding. So you think about it, you're bending over, you're using all of your parts, right? So growing that food, there was even one couple that I read about that had what they called, and that was a new, I, I can, believe me, I would have loved to have a straw bale garden back in the day because my dad used to go like a drill sergeant. We'd have to go pick green beans in the summer. <sighs> but they, this, this couple, rather than like doing all the work to do like a raised garden bed, they literally planted things in straw bales, plants, and made a garden out of that. Now, I don't know what your neighbors are going to say and how your HOA is going to feel about that if you have one, but if you don't, <laughs> it might be a consideration because it'd be quick and easy. Yeah. Is that right? Kent Rogers. That lives in Wake Forest? Yes. He okay. Up in Wake Forest. He has a fabulous website. Wake Forest, back in the day, colorized. He used to teach people how to do straw bales. He's not teaching so much, but you can actually contact him, and he will still help you. There you go. Okay. That's pretty cool. Uh, it was that for me it was the first I'd ever heard of that so if you've got a, a local who's an expert I would say dip into that and if it's something that interests you um, because anytime you're growing it for yourself not only are you tending it but you also have complete control over the that's exactly right the entire process so um, any there's no you know unless you apply them there's no pesticides and so forth right um, so uh, one of the other things that uh, these people in most of these communities were doing, we talked a little bit about the climbing, um, but they were constantly like preparing their own food and it was just, so it wasn't anything like we make an effort, like there's exercise classes here, right? But we're very sedentary. And one of the things this gentleman, Dave said, that has, has written about the blue zones, he said, I, I actually do not blame anyone in America if they are overweight because we have created a society that is counterintuitive um, to staying fit. And so part of that, remember back in, after the war, right, World War II, it became the American dream to have your own car in your own house. And part of the reason you had your own car was because the houses were built out in the suburbs and you had to drive in. And so it was a thing for everybody to have their own car, right? So it's, it's almost second nature. I mean, I can still remember this, you know, big discussion with my mom at the end over her renewing her driver's license. And, you know, she'd had eye surgery and she really didn't have any business driving anymore. And, you know, but I, I mean, it'd be hard to, to, for me to give them up. I don't, anybody else here have a hard time giving up their car keys and, mm -hmm. because car keys in America equals independence, right? Nobody wants to become dependent on anyone else. Um, and yet people in Singapore never owned a car, never driven, and they're perfectly healthy and happy. Uh, so very interesting, the differences between the, uh, the people who live in different places. Let's see if, oh, it's not gonna let me again. That seems to run out of charge. So community support, and this was talked about a lot. Um, so one of the first things that was really stressed was belonging and finding the right tribe. And so in Okinawa, one of the things one of the ladies mentioned that she did um, she was living on her own, and she, A, it was hard to afford everything on her, on her salary or on her, her savings, I guess it was, on her retirement. Um, but she also was lonely. And so she literally went out and solicited friends and created her own tribe. There's a name for it in Japanese. It's Moai, I think, but I, I could be wrong. And, and so really, they'll, like if somebody needs something, they'll pitch in money. They all pitch in. So they, they, they not only support each other from um, an emotional standpoint, but also financially to some degree because everybody can help each other out. And so, you know, you think about people who've lived in tribes. I, you know, my first, my, my mind goes to Native Americans almost immediately, right? And you think about how they all went out and gathered food together and prepared it together and so forth. And we've gotten to become very independent in the U.S., which I, I'm a big independence kind of girl, you know, like to be able to like stand on my own and do my own things. But I also see the value of interacting with people. And I think we have a chronic loneliness problem in the U.S. because especially with seniors, um, seniors haven't been brought into the home or the state in the home uh, or included in things as much in part of its distance, 
jobs and things take people other places. But it's also part of our culture that we aren't like Asian families, for instance, which it's just automatic that, you know, there's the oldest son takes care of the mother, right? Like that's just a given. Like their family takes them in and that's done. Um, and there's a builder that I've worked with. I love this guy. He builds a home that he adds a mother-in-law suite onto. So you find the land and then he'll build this for you. And you can live there with your family, but have your independence. And I said to him, can we just build like a whole, like I want a whole neighborhood that I can just go in and just sell. Like we need one of these, please. Because it's there's so much of that where seniors are now struggling to make ends meet. And if they combine resources with their family, they still want their independence because we're kind of, kind of ingrained, right? You still want to have your car and you still want to go do your things. But, you know, you don't want people in your business all the time, maybe. But how nice is that to have that safety net where, like the lady who was sitting on her behind and yelling at the car, you know, carpenters, come help me and no help comes. If your family's right there, they can come help. And you're contributing to them because one of the gentlemen in Singapore said, well, actually, I'm quite good at math. <laughs> and so he's the guy, he goes, her daughter, the daughter goes to work and he goes and picks the kids up after school, escorts them home and then helps them with their homework. How great is that, right? So I think that if we can do more, and that's, that has to do with conversing with your family and everybody has their own dynamic and their own feeling about that, right? So that's a, that's a conversation you have amongst your own loved ones. But you can also do that, you know, sometimes some of the best people in your life aren't necessarily the family that you were assigned, but the family that you've chosen, right? The, the friends who've shown over and over they're there for you. Yeah, Richard. Amish people or like that. They, they had a, another house and another house. That's right. A barn house. barn raising. and Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's a good point. You know, everybody has a job. Right. Like grandma, you know, works in the garden, yada, yada. Right, yeah. So that's another very good example of tribe. So I would, I would very much encourage you. I think those of you who come here, I don't worry about as much as I do the people who don't show up because um, I think those are the people who – just kind of get stuck in the rut of watching Will Fortune and Jeopardy every day and maybe Price is Right and whatever else comes on in between then. And, you know, maybe they go heat up a can of soup for lunch, but they don't get out much. And what does that do for you? It doesn't stimulate you. You know what I mean? Like there's, it becomes a rut. <clears throat> so if you have friends, family, neighbors that you think could benefit, you know, see if you can't kind of, you know, link arms and get some of them to come with you or take them out to lunch. Sometimes it's just that spur where they think, you know what, I should get out more. Like, why am I staying at the house all the time? Right? Why am I in my little apartment, whatever? Um, put loved ones first, and this can be family or friends. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, have a purpose. This was a big one. And there was a word they used for it in one of the communities. I can't remember the word, but it had to do with your mission whatever your mission is in life. And so I think sometimes people can get to a point in life where they've checked some of the mission boxes, right? Like you've had your family, you've raised them, um, you've had your career, you've, that box is checked, you're done with that, you don't want to do that again. Um, but what could be the new mission? What's, what are your interests? What, what drives you? And what could you contribute, not only to your family, but to your community? And are you doing that? My uncle that I mentioned earlier that fell... He broke his hip, which had been replaced before. That didn't go well. They replaced it again, and then he had diabetes, so he lost the lower part of his leg. He'd always been the go, go, go guy. He worked until he was 80, and he only retired because he took care of my aunt. He would have still worked. So now he's in his mid-80s. I stopped by to see him one day, and I said, have you seen the kids? Now, the kids live 10 minutes from him, like all the kids and grandkids, and they love him. He's like the best guy who... This he's just passed, but <clears throat> so I said, Have you seen the kids? Well, they invited me to dinner, but I don't want to be a burden. And I said, well, why, why do you think you're a burden, Uncle Jim? Well, you know, the whole wheelchair, schlepping it around. I don't know. I just don't want to be a burden. And I said, This is a gift. You know, like they think of all the things you could share with them 80 plus years of knowledge. And he, he could fix anything, he could do anything. I always loved, I mean, he was the nicest man. And I said, you know, you're denying them. You think you're saving them the trouble, but they've asked you out to go to dinner or come over to the house for a reason. They want you there. So please say yes next time they ask. 
or even invite yourself because they'd love to have you over. See when they're getting together next. So I think that have a purpose, sometimes people kind of lose sight of that because they've checked boxes and then they don't find something new. But you're never too old to learn something new, right? Anybody learn something new almost every day? I do. And I go, wow, I wish I'd done that <laughs> a few years back, <laughs> right? So find that purpose. And, and not only that, but reach out to other people and help them kind of direct. You know, if there's somebody you know that has a skill and it's something you'd like to learn, tap into that. Ask them because there's probably nothing they'd like to do better than teach you how to do that. It really gets your mind, doesn't it? I mean, like all of the juices get flowing. Um, and then make a point to be socially fit just as you make a point to be physically fit. I think, I think that there's almost like a guilt if you aren't physically fit um, and you think, oh, I should go do this today. But I don't think we think about the socially fit at all. And yet, so there's excuses. The weather, you don't feel so good. Somebody else might be sick. Oh, that's a long way to drive. I don't want to go the 20 minutes over there and then I'll get home late, right? Anybody ever use any of those excuses to themselves? All, in, all of them, <laughs> right? Right. So what if you turn that narrative around and you think to yourself, well, it's just 20 minutes. You know, I had this conversation with my cousin in Seattle and she said, oh my gosh, it's three hours to go where, you know, with this whole conversation around going somewhere. And I said, well, think about it. Back in the day, dad had to drive five hours for the same thing. Well, you're right about that. So part of it is our perspective, right? We get, you know, that's people say, oh, the traffic in Raleigh or Wake Forest or wherever, name, name your city. It's just terrible. Well, have you ever driven through D.C. <laughs> or around New York City? L.A., anybody L.A.? Yeah, does any of that compare to Raleigh or Wake Forest? Not really, does it? So part of that's perspective, and I do get it. it. You become desensitized. You have to feel comfortable. So I'm not encouraging you to do something you're not comfortable, you don't feel safe doing. But if you feel safe, you know, then, you know, get out of your shell a little bit. Oh, that's not going to work for me. I keep reaching for it. So here's some just kind of other tips from centenarians. Um, to get outdoors, and this was one of the big ones, and that, that kind of feeds into the climate where some of these people live, that it was a more mild climate. Do we live in a pretty mild climate? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, don't we? Yeah. And so there's a whole vitamin D thing. You need 20 minutes a day, and it doesn't mean it has to come from a pill that you take in the morning with all the other stuff that you get out of your little compartments, right? It could actually be from the sun. I know that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> to do something naturally, walk outside and soak it up. One of, one of the uh, pieces, the one about the, the, the um, group in Greece, there was a senior lady who walks out on this gorgeous beach and they show her taking off her, her cover up and she's got a bikini top and then they, they you know, show a ship or something out in the sea and then they flash back and she's on the rocks laid back with her bikini on and she's, just, you know, a little saggy stuff here and there, but by gosh, she's taking in some sun and good for her. Like nobody else is out there. Nobody cares. Who cares? Right. She feels good. Why not soak up the sun? Um, so that's being outside is, is kind of equates to activity. Like one goes hand in hand with the other. Right. So if you're outside, you tend to be more active and active is the name of the game here. My grandma used to say, I'm not going to sit around and rust. Isn't that a good saying? I'm not going to sit around and rust. She's in the back of my mind almost every day of my life. Why would I sit around and rest when I can go get something done? Um, have faith. And it really wasn't about the faith, whatever that is, you, Buddhism, Christianity, whatever it is. People of faith live longer than people who have no faith that they practice on a regular basis. And one of the little ladies in Sardinia, they asked her how often she went to services, church services. She was Catholic. And she said, oh, every day. And, and so the interviewer says, the hill, because he knew where the church was and he knew where she lived. And it was like straight up. And so she not only had to use her muscles to climb that, but then you got to use the brakes on the way back down. So you're using all the muscle groups just to go to church and back every day. And she said, it just gives me, you know, it gives me peace. 
So whatever it is that you practice, what, you know, some, some way that you find peace during the day or during the week and that you interact with others who have a similar thought pattern. Stay positive. Anybody know a negative Nelly? Or have you ever asked that one person that you know better and, and you go, how are you today? Because it's, it's like ingrained, right? And then you almost, you're like, oh, why did I do that to myself? Man, so don't be that person. And the people who are, who are those people, they don't know who they are, right? They, they don't recognize it in themselves. And so if you stay positive, all the people who were in, uh, in these interview groups were talking about how um, they're so glad they survived, name the issue. One of the ladies in Okinawa watched her mother and her brother die um, during the war. And it was really tough at that time. And they had taught, the Japanese had taught people, here's your grenade. If you see the bad guys come and take yourself out. And she said, we were captured before we could get to the grenade. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I survived that and that I've lived all of these years, you know, and, and experienced all of these many things um, just by the simple fact that she survived that. Is she still sad? Does she miss the people she loves? Yeah, I mean, that's part of, unfortunately, the fabric of life. If you've ever loved someone and lost them, it, it goes with the territory, right? But there's plenty of other things to look forward to. Um, keep your mind active and, and engaged. Many centenarians work later on in life. One of the ladies was still 100, and she was a doctor, and she was still working. Um, and, our, and or our volunteers in their community. And so if you ever want a place to volunteer, you're probably sitting in one of them. Right? I'm sure they'll take volunteers here if you go up and talk to one of the ladies at the, de at the desk. Um, another uh, group that I know of is the Senior Network. Um, so if any of you feel uh, driven to help out, it's a nonprofit group of ladies who um, they just take requests from seniors who need help. And so if you feel like you can contribute, whether it's driving someone to the doctor or changing a light bulb for them, or sometimes it's just companionship. Um, you can reach, I'm on the board there at the Senior Network, so I can put you in contact with those, those folks and they can get you signed up to volunteer. Uh, but there's plenty of opportunities. Your, you know, your church may have that. Your, you may have volunteer positions within your own community, depending on what type of um, community you live in. Uh, especially 55 plus communities will have a lot of volunteer groups that you can sign up for, clubs and so forth. So there's a lot of, a lot of places out there that you can put your energy um, I think that may be the last, yeah. Um, any questions? Anybody have comments to make? I watched the, the network, the uh, Netflix program. Uh -huh. I was, the program is very enlightening and it's very interesting. He's a very charismatic character. He is. Um, and all of this came across in a very positive way, which I think is good. But I do have a caveat in a couple points. The cultures that they lived in are small cultures. Our country is so huge that even when you live in a small village or a small community in a farm town, mm -hmm. many times the next town is miles over. Right. We don't have railroads in this country that work efficiently, and we don't have a bus service that works very well. So to travel and to do the kinds of things that you would like to do, you cannot do in our physical situation. You know, to live in Singapore would be great. To right. Live in a, if you live in New York, you take the subways, you live in an apartment. I mean, that's the conversation. Many of us don't live in that part of the world. We live in a semi-rural community, or we live out in the woods, or we live on a mountain, or we live in a commuter town like this. Mm -hmm. So taking some of that isn't as easy for us to adapt to. And the other thing I wanted to say was about grieving. I had an aunt who I visited. I have two aunts. One was just passed away at 93. I have one who's 95 and is still in Florida. The last time I, I went to visit them regularly, when the last time I went, my last aunt was volunteering at a senior center. <laughs> she said to me, she was really unhappy because all the little old ladies were so crabby. But <laughs> grief is a real serious part yes. at this stage of our life. We are losing our good friends, we are losing family members, and not just one at a time. I have a cousin who in one year lost his wife, his oldest daughter, uh, and his mother. Mm -hmm. He's a veteran, 
he can't break out of his depression. I mean, the holidays were wretched for him. I bet. Now he's got a diagnosis of cancer. Oh. The, the grief that we are surrounded with, I have lost so many friends in the last few years. People I was socializing with for 20 years, the husband is gone, the wife is gone, uh, somebody passes away and they move away. I mean, so you lose these people. Right. We need more grief counseling. We need more mechanisms for communicating uh, that positive thing about being positive. You need to listen. You need to be positive, but you need to listen to that person who is unhappy. Right. They may be just suffering from grief. They just need a, someone to listen to them. And they are telling you it's grief. Yeah. They're not going to tell you they're unhappy today because they lost a cousin and somebody called them last night on the phone to tell them someone else in the family passed away. I've had phone calls for two weeks. Now. I'm really down. I've had calls for two weeks now where people are either ill or passed away or I'm going to a funeral. I've gone to two funerals in the last six months. I don't want to do this. And so, yes, we can live a long life, but we have to find a way to, to navigate that. To navigate the grief, and we do have grief in everybody's family. Um, and, and it has to do with, we don't have a mechanism for, I mean, I go to church, but my church does not give me the support I need. Mm -hmm. My husband does not want to hear these phone calls anymore. You know, he, he goes off to his room. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. His sister has Alzheimer's. Um, I mean, we're all surrounded by this. It would be very helpful to have a much more formal mechanism for people to come to something, share their grief, and get the emotional support, even if it's from a room of strangers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, Sometimes that's, that's easier. Better Sometimes than it's easier. Than that's right. Yeah. So, uh, so a couple of things. So at the end of the, the last segment, he does talk to one of the ladies in Singapore who's some kind of government agent who, you know, has helped design all of this. Um, and he says, you know, how do we make this work in the U.S.? Because it's so vast and we're not, um, our infrastructure does not support like this, you know, tiny little enclave of, of Singapore. In relation. And so they actually took a town in Minnesota of about 18,000 people and put into place some things where the city got on board and helped build broad sidewalks and parks and had groups that got together for walking and supporting each other. And he says to one of the ladies, would you have ever been friends with this lady? They're out walking in a park. Would you have ever been friends with her without this program? And she said, no, I would not. So I what my mind goes to, because I totally agree, and you do think that as you watch this series, right? Um, is how to, yeah, but how, do you, how does that apply here, right? Because we, we've already kind of messed ourselves up the way we've designed our, 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 you know, our country in some ways. We've not set ourselves up well to live well um, in some ways. And so um, one of the things that um, I think resonates is you have to start where you are and, and figure out, you know, whatever it is. So if you live somewhere that is not like a, the kind of community that supports you, is that the right place to live out the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? So I would ask myself that question, first of all. And I'm not, there's, I don't know where you live and I don't know what that looks like. But maybe you need to live somewhere where you are surrounded by more people. Um, and that may be in smaller homes that are closer together um, that have activities or it may be in a senior community of some kind. But, you know, or maybe it is just getting more involved in your church or the places where there are activities that can help kind of embrace you. Right. Um, and so I think if you take the perspective of um, there's a story about this um, guy who's walking along the beach one morning and the beach is littered with starfish. And another old man kind of approaches him and sees him. He's throwing these starfish back, right? And the, the other old guy comes along and he says, what are you doing? You know, like, that's not going to make any difference at all. The whole beach, look at the beach. And the guy picks his starfish up and he throws it in the ocean. And he says, but it makes a difference to that one. And so I think that's where you have to start is with the one, with what you can control here. Because it feels depressing and overwhelming to think about, we, we know there's a big picture that could be fixed, but we have to start at home and with our own activities and our own actions to be able to affect those around us, right? And then at some point, maybe that's infectious. Um, and then in speaking to, the, I, and I can't speak totally to the part about the grief, but what, one of the things that popped in my mind as you were speaking, I, has, have any of you seen or read the, the last lecture? It's been a few years back since it came out. Randy Pausch 
is the author, P-A-U-S-C-H, I believe. And he was a Carnegie Mellon um, professor with a very young family, Littles. I think his wife was pregnant, actually, and he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, stage four, which anybody here who's ever dealt with that knows that's essentially a death sentence for most. And so he um, made the decision with his wife to move the family to, I think, Virginia to be closer to other families so that when he passed, they would be able to help step in and help with the little kids. And so he, he writes his last lecture that he gives as a professor at Carnegie Mellon. It's about 45 minutes. If you Google it or go to YouTube, it will come up. And it is well worth your time to watch that. And so one of the things that resonated with me, because I got the book after, which is the same thing, but he really talks a lot about making choices in your life. You can either choose to be an Eeyore or you can choose to be a Tigger. And, and I'm not saying every day is that easy. I'm not saying that. Um, but I do think that if you make a conscious decision to embrace the positive each day rather than look at the negative, you have to live looking in the windshield and not in the rearview mirror. And it is a conscious decision. Um, and, and, you know, I had, I was really close. So I'm going to try to say this without crying. I was really close with my mom. We had a great relationship. And one of my friends asked me after she passed, how are you doing it? How are you? How are you? And I said, I will not let the grief win. She would smack me over the head if I sat around on my hands all day. That is not what she raised me for. She raised me to go out and be better than that. Do I miss her? Every day. <laughs> But I say that to you, I understand, I understand that grief is, can be huge. But I also think that if you can focus on the other things, you know, get up every day and write down one positive thing or write down the three positive things. What are you grateful for? I do think that that can kind of help sh shift your perspective. Do I think that your cousin who's had so much loss in such a short amount of time, I don't think there's an easy button for him. Um, I don't. I do think he, if he's a veteran, I, I would encourage him to tap into some of the resources that are available to him because I think that he, in speaking to some of the other veterans, they likely have had some kind of similar path. And sometimes just knowing that you're not alone is enough. You know, that, you, that someone else has walked that path and they've come out on the other side. So that's one of the things that I would encourage. There is a, a book that I would recommend. It's Joan Didion, the writer, um, The Year of, of Thinking Magically, I think is the title. She lost her husband unexpectedly, and this is the year after the loss mm -hmm. that she writes this book. It's a fabulous book for widows. I give it to every friend I have who becomes widowed uh, because it's a very um, moving but also very compassionate way of understanding loss, um, and it's a wonderful book. And Joan Didion's a fabulous writer. Um, but I think the grieving is natural. Yes. We all have to grieve. Yes. So, you can't just put it aside. You actually no. have to go through the process to come out on the other side to and find that positive. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying that I think when we find people who are unhappy in our lives, maybe what they're doing is just grieving and we just need to take the time to, to talk and find out what it is that's upsetting them and why they don't want to leave the house or why they don't want to do something. Mm -hmm. It could just be grief, that, and they're not sharing that with you because you're not that close to them. Right. They don't want to burden you. you I know, think okay. one of the best responses I've found for someone like that is, tell me about her or him. Because there's nothing better than telling fun stories or you know, enlightening stories about someone you loved so much. It kind of brings them to life for a moment. And, and it also, it's very important, I think, for, for those of us who've lost, lost, and I imagine everyone in this room has, um, many people you've loved over the years, when you've lost someone like that, you want them to, their memory to be alive, to still be, you know, you don't want that to just have stopped and that person isn't here anymore, you know. And it reminds me of, um, my dad died 30 years ago, and my nephew never met him. He's 29. So he asked me when he was about 10 one time, what, what, was, what was your dad like? And I said, well, you know how great Mama is, my mom? And he said, yeah. And I said, double that. 
And, and I, it was such a tough question because how do you bring to life and, you know, and embody all of these things about this person that's, that's no longer there? Like, how do you do that for someone who's never met them? Um, and I think that's part of the sadness. You know, there's, there's a lot of sadness there, but yeah. So when my dad died several years ago, I don't know if y'all heard of this. I went to this grief share. Mm -hmm. It's a faith based program. I have, I've been to that with a friend. Yeah. yeah. And, um, it was really helpful. It was sharing. There's a workbook, there's a video. That's right. You know, and so it's several weeks. Um, so I found that very simple. Yeah. The one I went to with this friend had lost her son. Mm -hmm. And all of the them, all the people in that particular group had lost children. And sometimes they'll do them just for people who've lost spouses. Yes. You know, it's different yeah. Relationships. I thought it was. I just went the one time, but it was really holiday, great. Getting through surviving the holiday, you know. So mm -hmm. you Google that and find them in different places. I think that's a good suggestion. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get off grief for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to uh, throw this out because I to speak to the part that you know the infrastructure of where we live is not conducive to you know getting around even when you give up the car keys. You know, there's Uber and other things that you can use. That's right. But the pervasive culture of ageism that we have in this country. And I always think about, you know, if, if uh, well, uh, all right, I can put it to you. I'm like, I was talking to a friend just uh, two days ago. She just retired, and she's 75. Good for you, Carolyn, I said. She said, and guess what? Now I'm letting my hair grow out. That tells me, <laughs> that tells you that she had to color her hair until she was 75. She couldn't be herself, which was aging, because she still worked, she still was in the work culture. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, and I, I think, I almost said, well, why didn't you just let your hair grow out? Because she was afraid she would be let go, fired, whatever. And, and I think each one of us in here has to come back, come back that. Get out there. Do your thing. Let your hair grow out. Be who you are. And, 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 you know, if you want to go take that dance class, get in there and take that dance class or do whatever. But don't let the ages, that's how you have to fight that because uh, that's what the people that are, that are doing the transportation uh, things and uh, building these communities and things that aren't thinking about, well, they're going to get old too someday. No, they're not. So they have to see, you know, don't hide in your shell, get out yourself, there and meet who you are and do the best you can. And, you, you know, you still have a brain and you have a, a huge amount of experience. Mm -hmm. And where you said volunteer and, and, or go to work, you know, you see for hired signs everywhere. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's. That's what I'm saying. Even for a few hours a week, even if it's just something that you just go just to keep your mind right, right. occupied, there's, something to do. Yeah, there is a uh, pervasive ageism, and it's, you see it, you know, on the television, you see it everywhere. Yeah. People make ex assumptions, and I think that comes, you know, I, I can remember volunteering in junior high, I think it was, at, um, I went and visited at a nursing home for a couple of years, and it was in 4-H, it must have been to do with that. And I remember having the distinct thought gosh, why aren't all the old people nice like my grandma? Like there was some crabby people. There was certainly nice people there. And, and it came, you know, my answer came in coming every week and doing my volunteerism that some of them needed somebody to talk to. And they were lonely and, and angry about that. Angry about the fact that they were, you know, lonely and didn't have anything to do or anyone to talk to. And I, I you know, part of that I could see at the holidays that, you know, there weren't any, there was, there was no one coming in and I felt bad for those folks. And I realized, well, that's part of it, you know? So I do think that seed kind of planted, um, young for me, but I, the problem is it doesn't plant for a lot of people and, you know, you can only do what you can do. So be the example, you know, because the person I go to is my grandmother saying, I'm not going to rest, right. you know? Yeah. Um, might be a little bit long-winded in what I'm going to say. Go ahead. Karina, I want to compliment you on the great job that you've done today. Thank you. I, um, covered a lot of different materials, and you've been a, an example of being positive. Um, the, the blue zones that you talked about is an example of 
some things, you know, hey, can you take something from, can you learn or take something from others and apply it to yourself, right? Right. That's really what the Blue Zone thing is about. Yes, they did try to implement something in Minnesota and have implemented something in Minnesota as a, as a large group setting in the United States to see how they could do that. But, um, you know, take an example that maybe you need to move. You know, that would be a big thing, of course, a big change. It would be. But there is something that we all can do in our, in our lives and it might be just one little thing here and there. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is my wife's actually a, a psychologist from another country. Um, we can't get licensed here because of rules uh -huh. that are dumb. But really, <laughs> she's going into grief, grief counseling, grief, grief okay. counseling. So that we might want to touch base afterwards um, since you're running into so many of those people. But it's a, amazing, just, you're not, it, what you're experiencing is, is, is is very common, mm -hmm. very common. Yeah. And you would expect that. I mean, think we're baby boom generation, right? Well, the reason numbers are getting so big is because the numbers were, have always been big. That's right. It's just that it used to be in the 30s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. And and healthcare has improved <laughs> along that yeah along that same timeline. Our generation came from large families. Right. Um, and a lot of immigrants. So the, yeah, the baby my, my my in laws particularly, you know, they were all like seven, eight children, and they were all a couple years apart. So it stood that we deal with every cup, you know, more frequently people close to us dying. Sure. Because that's the way they were born. Maybe the generations coming up when there's only two or three kids now right. for family, or, or maybe they never even get to a funeral until maybe in their 20s or 30s. They, I met a young woman right. in her 20s. She said, I have to travel. Um, there's a, someone in the family died and I have to go down. And she never, and it was full viewing. I've never seen it. She yeah. didn't know how to deal with death. My cousin's kids were that way. Or the full viewing. When their grandmother died, my aunt. Yeah, they were in their 30s and to 40s. So, sorry, one last thing. Um, your point about ageism, of course it's true. But mm -hmm. I will like to give you a little bit of encouragement to the group. There are more and more folks realizing that there's a, a gem of wisdom and experience with folks that are gray-haired. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so there are some businesses corporations, et cetera, et cetera, that are looking for... Older people? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, yes, you know, let's fire everybody that's over 50 kind of mentality maybe in some situations. Yeah. Of, but at the same time, there's that recognition that, oh, <laughs> work ethic, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, just the drive, the experience, the wisdom, there is value there and we're not finding it in people that are younger. So. Um, let's look for some people that do have great hair. That's, that's, that's a so it's not a total. A that's total great. Work. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think there are some people who, especially if you aren't, if you aren't, a, aren't or don't want to be full time, that's a real gift to some of these companies. That's what they're looking for. That's right, because they don't have to provide the benefits. You're already covered in that way. They really only just need, a, you know, some somebody with a nugget of like common sense, <laughs> and maybe some skills for a few hours. And that's enough. Um, and so I do think you can, if you're looking for it, I do think you can find it. Um, it's just a matter of find, you know. And again, it may take networking and you know talking people in your tribe. And it's it's no like no other time, any other time in your life when you're looking for a job. So the culture you say is, is kind of changing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm an example. Good. Yeah. I haven't colored my hair. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> industry, um, but also some industry, you know, you're also, well, anyway, your point is valid. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to mention, it was about the grieving a little bit. This is my mom, and of course, that's one of the things we've talked about, Joan. We've talked about for a long time. Hi, Joan. It's, it's been so hard for her to outlive her friends and her sister and and I'm of course the age where it, it's hard for me it's it's part of this aging and it's almost surprising that they don't do they address that in this living to be a hundred or is it just is it just the community that they all grieve but they have others to share it with I 
I was I they don't know. they don't talk a lot about grief in this um i mean he visits the cemetery several times but it's really more just to point out how many centenarians mm -hmm. are there in the cemetery in that area um there's one the lady in sardinia there's an aunt who's never married she's a hundred and she lives with um different nieces and nephews and there was one point where she was in the hospital they tell the story where she was um ill to the degree that they had to hold her head up to, to feed and help her drink and and they said she probably wouldn't have made it out there had it not been for us joining around her. Um, so, but they don't really talk a whole lot about grief. Um, I do remember, so John, I remember my, my Aunt Patsy, which was Uncle Jim that I talked about, her, his wife. They were married 61 years. And Aunt Patsy was the crusty one and funny. And she, I would go v visit them once a month after my staff meeting when I lived down in Florida. And... Uh, she, every time I was there, she had to give me a report of all the people in South Bend, Indiana, where she had lived up until the 80s, um, who died. And she said, they're all dying. Every time I'd go, oh, they're all dying, Karina. They all die off. There's none of us left. You know, and she would tell me there was one friend in South Bend who was the reporter <laughs> who would call and say, did you know Susie died or whoever it was? <laughs> Because she was the one who'd outlived up there, and then Aunt Patsy and Uncle Jim were on, on the Florida side, and they had a couple friends that were down there. Yeah. I was going to say, and yet my mom has managed to remain positive, and that's something that people will say to her, like, how do you stay positive through all this? So how do you stay positive, Joan? Well, <laughs> I, I think you kind of go through stages. You, know, you used to lose one, and somebody else kind of picked up. It just seemed like had different groups as I went through. And now I just moved here from Colorado with my daughter here, and it's like a kind of a new lease now, you know? Okay, so you all it's, combined households? Yes, uh -huh. we took her in, I went back, and I, I, she was living independently, but it was, all of a sudden it was like, Mom, this is too hard. Do you wanna come home with me? And we brought her. And um, so, but I would think part of it is it is, you still are going to grieve, but you know, I've lost my only aunt and that was rough, you know, my, one of my best friends, it's, it's rough, but somehow I think it's helped mom and pulling through is that you have something new to look for, you have more social, so sometimes I wonder if the loneliness and the grief are so hand in hand. overcome, maybe, I don't know, you know, and I'm just thinking about things, you. Know, that's the other thing, physically, see. You go downhill. Because you're mourning that as yeah, well. Because I'm 92 now. Uh huh. And I say, well, it's okay to be 90, but don't go over the hill. You know? <laughs> <laughs> over 90 is not good. You know, you get in a car accident, too many things happen. Yeah. You know? And but she does hard. all those things. Uh -huh. I, I kind of thought, you know, I said, well, we do all those things already. Uh -huh. So the only thing that's hard is I still want to look at everything to be independent and bring too much into. What yeah. I'm trying to show. Uh -huh. Another another issue. Another we won't thing. go there. <laughs> well, I find that people they it takes there's a disconnect between what your what your brain says you can do and what your body can physically do, yeah, right? I, and and I mean that's I have those conversations with people in their homes all the time because I'm like you know they're sitting there telling me all the things and then I look around and I'm like but this isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to, I get that, like, you know, it's the whole thing, like, giving up your keys, right, like, at what point do you make those decisions, but I think that if you want to remain in the driver's seat, then you plan and make those decisions, if this happens, then this is my plan, right, so I think part of that is in knowing, make the choice, because Everybody says, "Oh, I just want to die in my sleep." When I, you know, when I'm going to be healthy and play pickleball the day before, and then die in my sleep. Well, good luck to you. I hope that happens. But we all know that other things, you know, other things can crop up, right? And and for many people, that's not the case. And so, if you're not winner of that lottery, the pickleball then die let lottery. If you're not that winner, then what are you going to do? And so, part of all of the things we talked about today can be part of the plan for between here and there. Right, but if this happens, then what? If this happens, then what? So I would challenge you to make, you know, to sit down and think about that. And if you're married, you know, discuss that with your spouse. Please talk to your kids about it. It's, I cannot tell you, we're gonna have communicating with adult children later this year. That's one of our subjects. And it is tough. I have some real bull, bulldogs of, you know, adult kids that they get in, they, they stand firmly in the way of what their parents want to do. 
And so you need to kind of think that through as well, especially if you're going to have a bulldog of a kid who thinks you should do X and you want to do Y. You're going to have to have that conversation with them sooner than later because when you're incapacitated in any way, they're going to bulldog that right into what they want to do. And you will not have plan B. That will not be your plan. It will be their plan. Guarantee you. I just had that happen to a couple that we toured senior communities together. And then his daughter came in out of town and put him into, you know, now did he go well, willingly? You know, I had the conversation with the lady and I said, I think he, I think it was a case of go along to get along. And she said, that's exactly what happened. And I said, it sounds like the daughter meant well, but she was on a timeline. She has a family. She has a career. She was here for a short period of time and she thought that was the best thing for him. Now, does she, does she think she's a bulldog? No. Does she think she ramrodded that in? No. But it's not ultimately what they wanted together as a couple. So now they've navigated that and she's feeling hurt and, you know. So have those conversations sooner than later, especially while you're strong and your mind is strong because the whole thing will get skewed if you don't, for sure. Other thoughts, comments? Um, yeah. I apologize for coming in late. But no, it's okay. So Carla was supposed to be here and had a, a staff member who was sick, so she had to fill in. Yeah, I actually had two people scheduled today, and then it was the Karina show. So I do apologize for that. Yeah, that's, the other lady was 98 and uh, worried about getting sick. Her family, step, and understandably so, understandably so. Yeah, other comments? A plug for um, a group called Oak City Cares. It's, uh, they, they serve the homeless community in uh, the Raleigh area, and there's all kinds of volunteer opportunities there. Um, they do a lot of good work, and uh, we went down on Christmas and served meals. Aww. We served like 150, I think. That's almost. nice. And um, you don't know whether you're bringing the gift or whether you're getting the gift. Yeah, I bet. Very fulfilling. And there's an answer to holidays. Do something for somebody else. Right. Yes. You have to learn to step out. Yeah. You know, that gives you purpose to get up in the morning. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's like anything else in life. It's going to evolve. And, and so you can either be in the driver's seat or you can let it drive you. So, you know, I, if it were me, I'd rather make, be making the decision. So think about it. And, you know, I think, again, those of you who are in this room are the planners. Um, the people who didn't come with you in those empty seats are the ones who, you know, in some cases... Maybe they just let life happen to them, you know, and, and letting life happen is okay, I guess, if that's really what you want to choose. That's, there's a lady I worked with in Florida who retired from the sheriff's department. She was a lovely lady. And um, Shirley said, she, this lady she worked with for a decade before she retired said, as soon as I retire, I'm going to get the biggest TV I can afford. I'm going to sit in front of it. I'm going to watch TV all day. <laughs> and she did for three years and dropped dead. Three years. Yeah. So Shirley was of the I'm not going to sit around and rust <laughs> group. <laughs> and, she, and that lady, I mean, I saw her out and about in that county all the time. She had a little red car. And that's, I mean, I'd see her and I'd be like, man, Shirley's out more than I am. <laughs> um, about the environment and safety, mm -hmm. is there any information on like getting a pet as we get older? Is that a good thing or is that more of a fall risk or... I don't know. You know, they get it. Uh, you know, yeah. I read an article yesterday that. to that very thing. Okay. You said pet. A pet. A uh -huh. dog. An article in Sunday's paper that addressed oh, really? that and said how good it is to have a pet. Okay. It's, it's very good for your psyche, for sure. Um, I do think the wrong pet would be a, a, a trip risk, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that has to be vetted for the specific situation and, and home and so forth. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a cat who, if I sit down, he is not only on my lap, but he throws himself against my chest and looks lovingly up at me. And so, you know, if he's not there, then he's asleep on the couch and I don't have to worry about ever stepping over him. So you need a coal, um, you know, rather than, you know, some little yappy dog that's not going to, yeah. If you haven't read a book called Being Mortal, 
That is a wonderful book. To listen to a being mortal, it's written by a, a doctor, and it, he taught. He does a lot of research about aging. But one of the things that they found when they went to assisted livings and did tests, any kind of pet helps your mental and physical health. But they said a bird. You know, it doesn't. It, any kind of pet. I don't know if fish qualify. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it was interesting in that book. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's there's a, and it's tied to longevity. It is. Yeah, because that helps fill in that loneliness. Yeah. And that you have something you're caring for. That's right, you're caring for. Yeah, my mom had three dogs at the end, and she and a cat that the neighbors had abandoned when they left. And so literally when we sold her house, we went to a new neighbor and contracted into the deal that they would take care of Sammy. Because <laughs> he was dependent on us by then. He would come to the front porch, and we would feed Sammy every morning. So that was, I knew my mom was, you know, everybody had to be, have it box checked or my mom would have been, you know, knocking on my door somewhere. That's <laughs> okay. Other thoughts? Any last thoughts? So um, before we leave, um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, on your chair, you would have had a, a survey. So if you would, please fill that out. It'll just take a minute. If um, you haven't yet and you would like to, you're welcome to subscribe to the monthly newsletter that I mail out. This is a snail mail, so you're going to get it in your mailbox, old-fashioned. <laughs> and um, it's a variety of topics. Some are about real estate and some are entirely not. Um, so just like this was really not about real estate. The other thing that feeds in here is living in a healthy home um, and one that's safe for you. Um, and then, uh, of course, the postcard that's on your seat, um, if you don't already have one, feel free to take that or take extras if you want to share them with your friends um, and get them to come. Uh, but these are the dates through July. And next month is leaving a legacy. Okay. I do. Normally there's panelists, expert speakers. Um, this is only the second time I've had to fill in where we had a last minute. Um, and fortunately it wasn't the uh, this one I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'm like doubled up <laughs> so, because one of the things they really warn you about when you're in real estate uh, school is you cannot give legal advice. So um, I do not want to be in, I will just be asking some questions and we'll have experts here who will be speaking. But um, this, this month just happened to be one that it was last minute and I was able to, I hope, I hope you feel that I was able to share some good information with you. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.